the strange doctrine of the sophist. 249E. Being. It's the nature of ultimate reality in grief. It's that which always is the same, no variations. As an experience, is the most brilliant light of being. That's why it's a realm of intellectual mysticism. <coughs> it's also experienced as pure beauty. <clears throat> Pardon me, by the perfection of a beauty symposium, mm. right? Republic, Primenides, Phaedrus, Republic. <clears throat> so now that we're going to move into 249E8, our good friend is now going to get into being. Hmm. Right? <laughs> Do we not then seem to have attained at last a pretty good definition of being? Certainly. I think we are now going to discover the difficulty of the inquiry about being. What? Well, therefore, the preceding paragraph should be the perfect description of being. <clears throat> D. Then <clears throat> the philosopher who pays the highest honor to these things must necessarily, as it seems, 
because of them, refuse to accept the theory of those who say the universe is at rest, whether as a unity or in many forms, and must also refuse utterly to listen to those who say that being is universal motion. He must quote the children's prayer, all things are movable and in motion. I must say that being and the universe consist of both. What is being? Um, all things immovable. All things in motion. And immovable. And at the same time, immovable. Right? Thank you. <laughs> I guess we <laughs> He read, first of all, he read this and then he read that. Different translations, though. It's going to be tougher. Oh. So you can see. By the way, are they the same? Not quite. The word now, becoming. Always in motion. <clears throat> it's the nature of the universe, of appearances, of the everyday world. <clears throat> in which there is also rest. What's he doing? Um, he's putting them together and calling that being in the universe. No, he's not putting them together. No, this is talking about the nature of ultimate reality in his definition. No. You mean the nature of ultimate reality defined as yes. your... Okay. No. Right. He's using the word being for becoming. He switched them. Is that right? Come on. <clears throat> Before we go any further. Looks that way. Yes or no? Sure. Yes. How can he do that? Why does he do that? You're absolutely right. That's the that's the fundamental problem of why it's called the sophist. Wait. Yeah. But why are you saying that he switched them? Well, He's using the word being for becoming because he does, he does say it's immovable, all things immovable. I mean, becoming is not immovable, is it? Yeah. Could, could this be another word for rest? 
Mm -hmm. So being is in rest and in motion. And it's and that's the universe consists of both. Being and the universe consists of both. What the word universe means is the world of appearances. It's not metaphysical. This is metaphysical world. Right? Prior to the universe, it's independent of the universe being. <clears throat> Remember, this is before LSD. <laughs> okay, no. So the question is, as you look at this, is there enough reason to say he's got, he's taking the idea of becoming and he's calling it being. And now he's going to say, I think we are now going to discover the difficulty of the inquiry about being. This is the way he defined it. <clears throat> there is a problem with this. There is a difficulty. What do you mean? My dear fellow, don't you see that we're now densely ignorant about it, but think that we're saying something worthwhile? <clears throat> he just said something as he, uh, I presume he must be talking in general, but not of the thing he just said. But we'll put that aside. Then watch more closely and see whether if we make these admissions, we may not justly be asked the same questions we asked a while ago of those who said the universe was hot and cold. <clears throat> hey, what questions remind me? What is he going to do? He's going to remind them of what they said about the universe being hot and cold. Agree? Easy. Certainly. I'll try to do this by questioning you. What does he have to question them for? All he has to do is say the universe was hot and cold. Ignore that, okay? I will try to do this by questioning you as we questioned them at that time. I hope we shall at the same time make a little progress. Very well then. You say that motion and rest are most directly opposed to each other. Hey. Motion and rest are not under the name of being in Platonic metaphysics, in the Republic, everything. So what's his departure point? Rest in motion. So he's taking a movable as rest. Then being is not, right? Then being is not motion and rest in combination with something else, different from them. Apparently. Hey. You're saying that these two terms in combination, you can't say that about being, this idea of being. Is that where he's going with this? No, I don't, I don't understand your point. 
Well, the point hasn't been made. If you're oh. puzzled, you're right. Okay. That's my point. Because he hasn't even explained what he means by taking them in combination. It would be nice if he gave an example, would he not? There aren't any. Watch. What is there left then? to which a man can still turn his mind to who wishes to establish within himself any clear conception of being. So, uh, uh, how is that connected with this last conclusion he came to? You skipped down a little. Do you know that? No. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's been doing that. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, well, that's because, yeah, please read it. No, um, if you want me to, I'll read through no, it. No, but, uh, no, no, please do it. But I don't know if that would help. No, it, right. it'll help. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> then being is not motion. Go ahead. Or did you then being is not motion and rest in combination, but something else. But being is not motion and rest in combination, but something else different from them. It rejects this. And they must be in some other sense, but not in combination. Did he just change his mind? Well, my problem is that you skipped about this much. And I, mm -hmm. so, let's, let's, if you don't think it's necessary. No, then. no, no, no. I'd rather go back. Please, pick it up. Well, take it from the beginning. Well, you, Yet you say both and each of these equally exist. Yes, I do. Is that right? Hey, they both equally exist. Yep. That's rest and motion. Yeah, okay, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Go ahead. And in granting that they exist, do you mean to say that they both and each are in motion, that both and each are in motion. Both in motion. Thank you. And rest. Wait a minute. Rest is in motion. Of course not. But do, you mean, <laughs> but do you mean that they are at rest when you say that both exist? Of course not. Being then you consider to be something else in the soul. A third in addition to these two inasmuch as you think rest and motion are embraced by it. And since you comprehend and observe that they participate in existence, you therefore said that they are. Eh? Mm -hmm. Hold it. Embraced by it. Did he change the subject and introduce a new term, soul? Yeah, and he's conflating that they are with that they exist, and that they exist so for that, that so that being can have both opposites. Which it embraces. But he's lost this original concept he, completely. He dropped it. I know. Now, now he adds a third. What? Yeah. If anybody else Wait, angry? when you say he lost his concepts, what do you mean, David? Well, well he stopped talking about rest and motion. He, he let go of being, and he talked about the being of rest and motion. He's no longer talking about the being as a, a being, but the being of rest and motion are now taken into consideration, and they're being contrasted. Okay. And then he drops it and adds to it now so. Yeah. You're supposed to follow? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, well, you <laughs> see. Because uh, I'm baffled. <laughs> see, you can't be baffled. The text can be baffling. If you say, I am baffled by the, if I am baffled, 
then you're taking the burden. Yeah. I'm saying take a look at the text and let's take a look at it. Well, I think this is an excellent exercise because because everybody has this problem of lacking consistency in their thinking. And to be able to check it at every point is yeah. great. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yes, yeah. I get that. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. David, I really appreciate your saying that because I was just sitting here asking why the hell do you spend any time in this? Does anybody spend any time in this dialogue? But that's it. That's, I mean, that's a great reason. You, you know, people are, if, if, if what you just said is true, people make this kind of mistake or it, you know, maybe it's intentional all the time, they don't follow up, they, they drop points. And so this is really a type of exercise to go through and catch as many of them as you can. It, it, is, it is an exercise, but I think fundamentally it's a satire. Uh, well, why are we laughing? I really, if we could film this, and have a group of people sitting around who could follow this, they'd be nudging themselves and laughing and, oh, ho, ho, ho. Mm -hmm. mm. It's a satire. But, but, but when we're talking about rest, motion, being, soul, I want to take this seriously. Not like, I want these are serious thing. ideas. What? Well, I just want to know one thing. What, what can you learn so far about the nature of soul if it has rest and motion in it and in a different way than its combination? What, what? Well, it's a receptacle. <clears throat> well, that it would always be going towards want, either rest or emotion. Can you uh, maintain that with a quote? I'm just reading this because I can't understand this. <laughs> <laughs> right, here we go. Hey. For Greek, the word soul doesn't have any metaphysical existence. It's accepted that there is something in man that has three parts. A rational part, a spirited part, and the appetitive. And in, on reflection, they add one more thing to this, a certain kind of reasoning, and that's the uh, usia, the reflecting upon oneself. Another way, a development of reason is also the dialectic. But they're, these are the three categories. So, um, <clears throat> of course there's rest, rest and motion in it. What's surprising about that? <laughs> what? Because you can uh, rest, forget about reasoning and reflecting and take a nap or you no longer have the spirited, passionate part working itself out in your body, and you're not eating or the appetitive part. That could be at rest. That could also be in motion. There's nothing special about that. Of course, it can be at rest in motion. Mm Here, can I just ask a quick question about one thing you just said? You said, uh, did I get this correctly, that to the Greeks, the soul was not a metaphysical thing? For them, it was just uh, accepted. 
What did, what did you mean to say? Well, wait a minute. 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 Would you agree, everybody would agree, that there is some rational element in man? Yeah. Oh. By the way, also passion? Yeah. Oh. Also the appetitive? Yeah. They put a name around those three. So, it is not assuming it's eternal, it's not giving it any metaphysical qualities. It's almost biological. Of course. But. Oh, so you're talking about these qualities of soul, but I thought you were talking about the soul itself was not seeing metaphysically. I guess I misunderstood. Okay. Oh. In the Republic. The end of the book one. The people in the Republic, they say, oh, Socrates, you believe the soul is, a, is immortal? I never heard that. They can accept the idea of soul without attributing to it the quality of being eternal and, Almost, other, and other qualities. And the word they use is uh, suki, right? Mm -hmm. The psyche, suki, right? Pardon? That's the Greek word for it, psyche, right? Yeah, psyche. So it's almost like the, it would be as unsurprising for them as it would be for us to just talk about personality. Right? It's not something that's enduring, sort of past. That's right, go. Hmm. But what, uh, how about the account of soul in the Timaeus? And the fact that Socrates does declare and argues that the soul is immortal. Of course. That's, that is <clears throat> metaphysics. So, but are you saying that even though Socrates does that in the time in Timaeus, it's not something the average Greek would have done? In the Timaeus, Plato is saying, now let's take a look at this idea and, and essentially He's saying two things. He's saying, how do you account for this existence? What is it about it that ties all of these together? And so he says, you know what? There has to be something fundamentally intellectual in the universe. a certain curious property, a certain intellectual ability that allows us to turn upon ourselves and to know ourselves. This is, by the way, this is pure. Oh, by the way, there's another kind of this stuff and that, that binds and, go, and is around living things. Therefore, this can be separated and it can be around individual things. Therefore, it now has, this is impartable, no parts. This is partable. This is around living things, dogs, cats, animals, anything living, because all living things have some sense of themselves. They must have some degree of, of, of we can call that the rational element. To whatever degree they function, they must function with some sense of rationality, no matter how slight. Seeking their own best interest. Pardon? Seeking their own best interests? Yes. Therefore, it presupposes some operation of mind. These two together, look here. This and this then are mixed. And that produces a new kind of thing, and that's called soul. Then, this kind of thing then is dispersed to all living things. Wow. 
and in doing so, it then brings with it life, reason, right? And for life, what needs the appetitive? There we are, one, two, three. Define what you mean by appetitive. Pardon? What do you mean by appetitive? Do you mean drives or appetite or instinct? Or the appetite. Uh, essentially, what you can satisfy within the body, what goes out and, and motivates you to anything else, okay. anything else, that's passion. That's the language they use. So it's like inside, outside, thinking. So for him to say, soul is motion and, and rest, yeah, there's nothing surprising about that. So what is he going to do with it? There's difficulties with it. Let's see them. Here. Please. Um, at the 158 or 258 uh, B, where he says being then you consider to be something else in the soul, a third, in addition yeah. to these two. So he's talking about being, motion, and rest in the soul. Are you talking about 250? 250B. 258B. 250B. 250 B. B8. Okay, B8. Oh, 250B. You're, you've got it. Okay, so being and rest and motion are in the soul. Right. Yeah, rest and motion are embraced by it. And since you comprehend and observe that they participate in existence, you therefore said that they are. Has he now introduced a new term? Participate? Yeah. Did he explain it? And when you participate, you gain existence. Hey, is it possible that someone could have said, uh, did you change the subject and now you're talking about the soul participating in existence? Would you mind telling me what that means? Or is it obvious on the face of it? Well, no. But, but, but it's not the soul that's participating in existence. It's they. That would be rest and motion. And being. No. The third element, being. There's something else in the soul. Yes or no? Well, I'm just reading. It says, since you comprehend and observe that they participate in existence. It's a plural. That's quite true. But the, your first question. Being then, you consider to be something else in the soul. Something other than what he just described, which is what? Rest in motion. Yeah. Now, do you comprehend? Watch. Do you comprehend and observe that the soul with rest and motion participates in existence? Comprehend and observe? Well, how do we know? I, 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 um, I like Ingmar's question. I'm, I'm paying attention to that they also. How do we know which of these four things that they refers to? Soul, being, motion, rest. And motion, and participating. What's doing it? Well, they participate in existence. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, soul, being, motion, rest, yeah, those four. So what is the they, which, is it, is it purposely they there? What he just described is the they. 
All Good. four. Yeah. Of the, even though he said three. But we're adding soul to it. Yeah. And participating. And existence. I can understand. Five. Hmm? You can understand. You can understand. The question is, do you comprehend that? And do you observe that? No. Neither do I. He's making an interesting claim, is he not? Yes. Another one. Look, risk it. Go further. Let's go to the next one. The cheetahs. We really do seem to have a vague vision of being as some third thing when you say that motion and rest are. Did he agree or disagree? We really do seem to have a vague vision of being. He was just asked, do you observe and see this? Would you agree in the preceding paragraph he's asserting that you should be able to comprehend and see those? Yes. Does Theotetus say, oh, absolutely. Yep. No. No. What does he say? <laughs> we really do seem to have a vague vision of being as some third thing. Is he agreeing? Thank you. There is there a weakness in this? Yes. Good. Hold on to it. His response, come on. Then being is not motion and rest in combination. What did he just reject? What he formally set out. Is that correct? Well, I don't know. Then being is not motion and rest in combination, but something else. Right? They're not in combination. Hey, they are not in combination. They're in some other relationship. Wouldn't you like to know what the new relationship is? Yes. Good. We'll get it. Will you read the next section? According to its own nature, then, being is neither at rest nor in motion. Wait a minute. He just said he's going to do away with the idea of rest and motion in combination. Now what is he saying? It's neither at rest nor in motion. Now he's rejecting these two. Is that right? Uh, I don't, okay, I don't see that either. I just see him, uh, I would perhaps interpret, but I'm... According to, to its own being, nature... It's separate from rest or motion, so it's neither at rest or... Uh. What is this now? Try it. According to its own nature, that's being, yeah. then being is neither at rest nor in motion. Or is he going to give us an alternative? Yeah, is he offering an alternative yet? No. No? He just rejected it. Uh, would you go further? Come on, do it one more. You're about right. What is there left then to which a man can still turn his mind who wishes to establish within himself any clear conception of being? No clue. What does that mean? What Has he just rejected everything he said about it? Yes, so he's leaving you with nothing. 
Isn't that a curious way of reasoning? I'm going to tell you about being. I'm going to reject everything I say about it. Yeah, that's why it's a great book. Yeah, go to the next paragraph. What indeed? There is nothing left, I think, to which he can turn easily. For if a thing is not in motion, it must surely be at rest. And again, what is not at rest must surely be in motion. But now we find that being has emerged outside of both these classes. Is that possible then? No, nothing could be more impossible. What did you just do? You gave a nice talk about rest and motion, but concludes, but we find that being is, has emerged outside of these classes. <laughs> So he has not contributed anything about being that, has he? No, it seems just more more right. We'll get it. We'll get it. Um, then there is this further thing which we ought to remember. What is it? That when we were asked to what the appellation of not being should be applied, we were in the greatest complexity. Do you remember? Of course I do. By the way, has he been talking about this? struggle to understand being? Has he changed the subject? Yeah. Now we're going into not being? Mm -hmm. Since he did such a beautiful job explaining being? I think these guys sat around with their, their diluted wine. <laughs> huh? Undiluted wine. <laughs> Perhaps undiluted wine. <laughs> <laughs> Has he just changed the subject to not being? Yes. Yeah. What do we... Oh, now we'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. It's a farce. Well, he does so much to mess up each argument that from, from the beginning to the conclusion of each argument, there's also no consistency there. Right. And throughout the argument, there's no consistency. Right. Step. And he changes subjects all the time. And so, and, but, but now he can go to, without really having treated with what being is, he's going to now say, well, maybe we have to examine not being, because by examining not being, we can get a better idea of what being is. No, he's not going to go there. He's just changed the subject. No. Well, if, we keep, if you keep reading, he's saying, look, we had perplexity about not being, and now we got perplexity about being, too. It's like he's saying, look how dumb we are. Yeah. Well, he's trying to explain both. <clears throat> but now we'll, we'll get a good idea of, of non-being. Or do you think we're going to end up in the same place? I'm not sure. Let's try it. Go ahead. Of course I do. Yeah. Well, then are we now in any less perplexity about being? It seems to me, stranger, that we are, if possible, in even greater perplexity. <laughs> uh, well, then this point, uh, then, let us put down definitely as one of complete perplexity. But since being and not being participate equally in the perplexity. Has he shown any perplexity about non-being? No. Is he assuming it? Yes. Go ahead. There is now at last some hope that as either of them emerges more dimly or more clearly, so also will the other emerge. If, however, we are able to see neither of them, we will, at any rate, push our discussion through between both of them at once as creditably as we can. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a few minutes on that, you will now enter into another puzzled state. What did he just assert? Come on, take a look at it.
Doesn't matter where we go. But well, he says they will emerge either clearly or dimly, or both. And at the same time, no. no. And you? the other will emerge with equal or confused. Very nice. And if we get neither of them, will at any rate push our discussion, which it seems to be between both of them being able to push the discussion regardless of whether or not you, you land on what you're looking for or not. That's right. And we'll do it creditably. With credit. Creditably. Credibly. How can you, and how can you, how can you push through with credit? Seemly. But look here, all you're pointing to is it doesn't off. make sense. Yeah. And That's all. Them? Now you're reading. And between them, how can you have a gap between being and not being? What? I'm thinking this must be an example of where some kind of modern philosophy, the way they reason, goes. And I don't know the name of it, but where you can you can play word games That's to build then. one thing and then you can destroy it. And but but it's not meal. even it's not even done. It is it's not even done with skill. It's grossly offensive in terms of following a rational argument. Well, well, to talk about pushing the discussion between being and non-being, it sounds right, like you can go between two different things, except being and not being are not things. So you're mixing the materialistic world with the yes, non-material world. Yes, if you read it that way, what is between the two? There's no. impossible, nothing. Nothing. Everything's either one or the other. So that's a very nice rhetorical remark he makes, but it doesn't make any sense. Right. Well, that's, it gets better. I mean, he has to make sense sooner or later. <laughs> you think so? OK, go ahead. Let's go. It would be nice if you would. Good. <laughs> that's yes. one of the clearest statements in the book. <laughs> Let us then explain how we come to be constantly calling this same thing by many names. Have we? What same thing? No. But go ahead. What, for instance? Good question. Does he answer it? Of course. Please give an example. Go ahead. Please give him. We Sorry. speak of man, you know, and give him many additional designations. We attribute to him colors and forms and sizes and vices and virtues. And in all these cases, and countless others, we say not only that he is man, but we say he is good and numberless other things. So in the same way, every single thing which we suppose to be one, we treat as many and call by many names. Uh, by the way, uh, did he change the subject? Yes. And now he's talking about man. Before, the goal was to talk about non-being. Did he just change? Mm -hmm. This has a slippery eel. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a nice statement about man, which we can either agree or not agree with. But is it helping us understand being or non-being? Oh, it'll get clearer. Go ahead. You know what this guy? This guy reminds me of political speech. Yeah. Right. Now the next paragraph you're going to enjoy. Okay, it's a real fun one. True. And it is in this way, I think that we have provided a fine feast for youngsters and for old men whose learning has come to them late in life. Uh, who did he leave out? Women, adults. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I think there's a, is there a gap between children and men late in their life? Yeah. How many people would that be? Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> keep going. For example, 
it is easy enough for anyone to grasp the notion that the many cannot possibly be one, nor the many. And so apparently, they take pleasure in saying that we must not call a man good, but must call the good good, and a man man. I fancy, Theotetus, you often run across people who take such matters seriously. Sometimes they are elderly men of, uh, whose poverty of intellect makes them admire such quibbles and who think this is a perfect mine of wisdom they have discovered. Huh. Well, come on. Now we can just Certainly. No, no, no. Well, come on. What is that paragraph? We can come throw on. out the Parmenides. No. Questions about one and many are just uh, an intellectual game for people who lack intellect, who have poverty of intellect, and they admire such quibbles. Yeah. These are the people, young people and people in their old age, right, or late in life. This is what they've discovered. They take pleasure in saying that we must not call a man good, but call the good good, and a man man. Hey. Do you think a child might have trouble knowing a man, man is man and good is good? Keep those separate. And then he says, by the way, if you, take, you, you might find people who take this seriously, but you know what? They're quibblers. Therefore, what kind of example did he use? A quibbling example. Now remember the two groups he has. Got the two groups? Mm -hmm. Now he makes a good conclusion. I think that includes everyone. Okay? okay. Continue. Well, but it, it, there is this footnote at the bottom. Excuse me, I'm not trying to say this guy, but he is, he is saying that, that he is, uh, the Loeb is saying that, that he's satirizing these, these three guys. Uh, who he's probably referring to as the old man who's learning game and played in life, and all he could do is just do equivalences. Well, what I think he's, his mistake is, he's trying to take this seriously and find examples of these kinds of people. And that, the translator's mistake is that he's trying to yeah. find historical examples for something which is a sham argument. A sham argument. <laughs> but, but there's more in that paragraph, come on. To include Remember, we have two groups of people he's talking about? Yeah. And now what is he, how does he conclude? And to include in our discussion all those who have ever engaged in any talk whatsoever about... That's everybody. All those. Okay, go ahead. Let us address our present arguments to these men as well, as to all those uh, with whom we were conversing before, and let us employ the form of questions. So we're good with questions. What are the arguments? Okay. What is he going back to? Uh, being. That's right. Shall we attribute neither being to rest and motion, nor any attribute to anything? Let me try it. Shall we attribute neither being to rest in motion nor any attribute to anything? But shall we in our discussion assume that they do not mingle and cannot participate in one another? Or shall we gather all things together believing that they are capable of combining with one another? Or are some capable of it and others not? 
Which of these alternatives do you need to Why should we say is there a choice? Hey, we're still on being and back to, hey, back to rest and motion. Did he reject those? A while ago. Now they're back. Ah, I cannot answer these questions for them. Then why did you not answer each separately and see what the result was in each case? I could suggest them, oh my God. Um, a I'm good, for the door right a now. good suggestion. Um, <laughs> so. Go ahead. Some people are taking this seriously, actually. More and let us, if you please, assume that they are first, that, that they say first that nothing has any power to combine with anything else. That emotion and then motion and rest will have no share in being, will they? Why does he say that? No. Will then. Will either of them be if it has no share in being? Yeah. See how by this admission everything is overturned at once and, as it seems, the doctrine of those who advocate universal motion, that of the partisans, that of the partisans of unity and rest, and that of men who teach that all existing things are distributed into invariable and everlasting kinds. For all of these make use of being as an attribute. One party says that the universe is in motion, the other says that it is at rest. He, he can juggle a lot of words, that guy. Yes, now what do you have to do? You either go back and try and figure out what he says. That's right, again and again and again. You have to really go, and then, and it, it, it is harder than the Parmenides to understand this thing. Well, um, and that only took 40 years. Yeah. No, because it, each one of these, I mean, I didn't understand what I just read. <laughs> I didn't get all the distinctions and I couldn't conclude about each sentence. So well, but I would really have to go back and do a sincere job of reading and the if you were to do it, you would hope there would be some rational order to it. Yeah. <laughs> and if there isn't, you will then understand why you're not able to piece it together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you still want to give it that old college try. Okay. <laughs> Let's try. Come on, give it the college try. Exactly. Wait a okay. uh, that was a silly question. If that's really what we're doing, and this, this dialogue starts, I mean, it's not a small dialogue. What is it called? 265 to 459. I mean, if that's what we're doing, this is a pretty fat dialogue. If we're doing that again and again and again. I mean, I think of Plato as a sparse writer. He doesn't put anything in there that doesn't belong. He doesn't. Oh. This is just going on and on and on with the same. I mean, this what he's doing could be done in a couple of paragraphs. And be done. No doubt. Now you understand the puzzle. Yeah. So why is it like this is torture? And there are people who <laughs> quote this guy, the, the sophists, Plato, sophists, to make philosophical points. Yes. So well, I would hope so because then, then we'll find it. No, no. Time. Look, here. he has to finally make sense of something. Agree? <laughs> Why? Why does he have to? Hey, Jeff, would it be easier or tougher to understand if he did all of this in a couple of paragraphs? It'd be a lot easier. Mm. But he didn't do it in two paragraphs. No. Mm. So what do you see that I'm missing? Well. It's not two paragraphs. So? So I'm not sure. I'm missing how you think that he can do what he's doing in two paragraphs. Because Pierre keeps saying the same thing, that, that with each paragraph, and we just agreed that with each thing that we go through, you have to stop, you have to read it, see the ridiculousness of it. Well, we've been doing that for 
a good number of pages already, and there's a good number left to go, but we're going to keep seeing the ridiculousness of it over and over again. You could do that in one ridiculous and be done. So I see that. Why repeat it? Try this. He's probably wrong. Can you find a paragraph that makes philosophical sense so far? Oh, no. I'm not. I'm, I wouldn't make that claim. What? <laughs> but that's different than what Jeff is saying. So, look. So, I, I, I'm willing to admit I obviously am missing something here. That's my question. Okay. Look here. One more week on this. Right? But now, do it yourselves and try to find a section that does make philosophical sense. Yeah, right there. There's only a short number of pages left. And if you can't find any, now you have a bigger problem. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, a bigger problem. Find out why Ingmar wants to be serious about it. <laughs> hey, there are all kinds of people in the history serious, of yeah. philosophy that pick up this book and they quote it as its genuine philosophical reflection. I'm saying, let's find it before we put it down. So far, we're having a hard time. <laughs> That's all. I don't want to defend it. I'd like to see it. And that's why Nancy has decided to handle the next Friday and, <laughs> and make it all clear. And make it all clear. Try, try, Thanks, try experiencing that for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. That's how long I've been reading it. The problem is that you really need to know how to do this. Oh. How to listen to somebody's argument and see how they That's right. so, totally fail at That's right. completing a thought. And that's very important because I, I run into it, it all the time. Do. Bring them in yeah. and share us with what they're saying, please. Most people, most people, most people I've met, they're going to assume it's meaningful. And I always say, show it. Do you want to come back? Are we going to come back? Yes, we're yeah. Might as well. Yeah. I hope so. I, uh, can't stay to pick things up. So, Ingmar, you have to. Hey, Proclus thinks this guy's great. Oh, really? I was looking here on the internet to see what people have to say about it. There's quite a bit out there about it. They think he's saying something meaningful about the problem of non being. Oh, okay. Why would you want to say anything meaningful about the problem of not being? That's right. <laughs> we need to get a clear grasp of this non being. Here? You don't have to help. We can break this down so quickly. Well, I have infection.